You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. Hey, this week we're going to be examining Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. We're making our way through the book of Mark. We're getting close to that halfway point. I titled this morning's message, Never Give Up. Never Give Up. Let's begin with just a little bit of recap so that we can get everybody on the same page. Mark has shared a number of Jesus' miracles. He's faced off again and again with the scribes and with the Pharisees, and it's been a pretty rough time for Jesus. He's seen a lack of faith on the part of his disciples. He's seen a lack of faith on the part of his family. He's seen a lack of faith on the part of his own hometown as they literally chased him off. Up until now, Jesus has been spending most of his time ministering to the Jewish people in the provinces where they lived. His ministry was drawing some overwhelming crowds, just so much so that as a result, he and his disciples couldn't find time to eat, couldn't find time to rest, couldn't find time to sleep. They were just plain exhausted. So Jesus left the Jewish providences and he went into the Gentile territory for just a little while. It seems once again he's hoping to get some rest. He's hoping to get some time away. And that's where we pick things up today as we get rolling. And let's begin by reading Mark chapter 7. Verse number 24. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he could not keep his presence a secret. That's how very well loved and very well cared for and sought after Jesus and his disciples were. Jesus and his disciples are headed into Gentile territory. They thought that it might be a little bit uncomfortable for the Jews, but in the process of going from the Jewish areas to the Gentile areas, maybe it would, maybe it would calm the crowds down just a little bit. Maybe there would be fewer people. They hoped it might make it so they could get just a tiny bit of rest, so they try and keep it a secret, and incognito they go into this house, but they just can't get her done. Whenever they get inside the house, word spreads like wildfire, and people start to come. Now, Jesus' mission remained the same. He had come to seek and to save the lost. This event is going to make it clear, however, that his grace will eventually reach across cultural and ethnic barriers. And I'm guessing for us here, that's a really good thing. Because I'm guessing most of us aren't Jews. We are Gentiles. And this is like that little crack in the door. He begins to open the door to the Gentile people in a very unique way. God's gift of grace was going to be for all who would believe, not just for the chosen few, not just for the Jews. He's going to kind of crack the door open so we can begin to see that, but it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable as he does. You know, this is kind of an uncomfortable beginning here in the book of Mark, there in chapter 7. This woman comes to Jesus, and she asks Jesus to help her, to take care of her daughter. And what he responds is really uncomfortable. It makes you almost cringe. Have you ever had somebody say something that makes you step back and and almost like put a a fence up and say, I can't believe you said that? You ever done that? You can't say that is what you're thinking, but Jesus did. Now listen to his words. They're going to sound a little bit weird. He says, she's asking for help, and he tells her, First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Doesn't that sound a little uncomfortable? Doesn't that sound really uncomfortable? 
It seems to be a really unbecoming response from Jesus. This poor mother simply wants Jesus to help her daughter. The fact is, this Gentile woman had the courage to ask this Jewish man for help. That's amazing in and of itself because the Gentiles weren't supposed to have anything to do with the Jews. They stayed in separate areas. Jesus has come there to kind of get away. And here she is begging him for help. And he said, no can do. Uh, no can do. The children have to eat first. Wow. Can you imagine being that poor woman finally getting the courage to go up to this Jewish man and ask for help? Only to be told that he's going to blow her off. No, nope. children first. Children first, then the dogs. He told her, first let the children eat all that they want, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Do you catch what Jesus is telling this woman? In essence, he's calling this poor woman a Gentile dog. That's really uncomfortable on the surface. It's not a very pleasant statement at all. When you get some of the history in the background, Jesus isn't being quite as abrupt and obnoxious as it seems like he's being. A more accurate translation of the word there would be a Gentile puppy. It's diminutive, that's a big word. It means that it's a little dog. It's not like a big grown-up dog. It's a, it's a little puppy, if you will. Jesus is saying, you know how families customarily eat. First the children eat at the table, and after they're all done, if there's anything left over, the pets get to eat too. That's just the order of things. It's not right to violate that order. You've got to keep things in the order they're supposed to occur in. The puppies must not eat food from the table before the children are finished. They need to have all that they want and that they need first. Now that makes common sense when you say it that way, doesn't it? It's like, that's not a big deal. The dogs get it later, but they still get fed. Matthew's account gives us a, a little longer version, and in the process, he includes just a little bit of explanation. He says, Jesus told her that he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, this has been the focus of Jesus' ministry up until this point. He's been going to the lost sheep of Israel. But after his resurrection, he's going to look at his disciples when he comes back to see them again, and he's going to tell them to go into all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. <laughs> he says, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. In essence, he's opening the door to everyone at that point. With this as background, his words are not quite as big of an insult as they first appear to be. What he's saying to this Syrophoenician woman is, please understand, there's an order here. I'm going to Israel first. The Jews get first billing, but then the Gentiles will have everything they need. Let's keep reading. And Jesus tells her, in essence, she's a little puppy under the table. Her reply is astounding. She says there in verse 28, Yes, Lord, she replied. But even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Wow, what a word picture. What a word picture. Yes, Jesus, but even while the children are eating from the table, the puppies underneath, if a crumb, fall, if a crumb falls down, they can eat it. They're allowed to, to lick it up and to swallow it down. And Jesus, please, just a crumb. Her heartfelt response is overwhelming. She understood exactly what Jesus was telling her in your time. She made an excellent point, though. And Jesus understands what she's saying. This woman was willing to sit at, sit at Jesus' feet and beg for Jewish crumbs. She sets aside all pride, all expectations of being able to fix her daughter on her own. She doesn't demand to be treated as one of the children. She's not asking for a seat at the table. Her daughter's suffering. That demon's wreaking havoc inside of her. And all she wants is just a crumb or two so that her daughter can get better. This woman says, in essence, what harm will come from letting us have the scraps? You got the picture there? Her display of humility, though, is amazing. What a perfect example of being poor in the spirit. She's coming to Jesus completely empty. She was completely willing to take whatever Jesus was willing to share. We, like this Gentile woman, need to realize that we've got no leverage when we come before Jesus asking for things. We've got no leverage at all. We've got nothing to offer Jesus. In our need, we must learn to lean on his grace. And that's exactly what this woman did. She leaned on the grace of Jesus. 
Now her tenacity is noteworthy. She never gives up. She just keeps right on going. This woman's response is astounding. Let's look at how Jesus responded to her down in verse number 29. Then he told her, for such a reply, for such a reply, because you had such a good comeback, because you understood what I said, because you understood everything so well, and you came back with such a perfect response, then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. In Matthew's account, Jesus commends this woman's faith. Mark commends her humble response to Jesus' question. Her faith must have been absolutely huge. You see, Jesus doesn't go to her house. He doesn't follow her home to see the daughter. None of that stuff. He doesn't touch her little girl to make her better. None of that stuff. He doesn't say a word to the demon. None of that stuff. He simply tells this Gentile woman that he's already taken care of her daughter's issue. Just go on home. I've already got her done. That's the picture being painted. And she didn't ask for anything more. She simply accepted him at his word. This woman in faith took Jesus at his word. Her faith. It reminds me of the story of the Roman centurion. Remember him? He asked Jesus to just say the word and his servant would be healed. It seems the whole point of this miracle is not the healing itself. I think that the healing is a sidebar to what Jesus is actually trying to get across in this interaction with this woman. Jesus wants us to see the growing relationship that he's going to have with the Gentiles who come to him with true faith. It might be the crumbs now. It might just be the crumbs now, but soon they're going to be invited to the table. They're going to be made children of God. Jesus' words were enough for this woman, and his words should be enough for us. This little girl was completely freed. The demon that possessed her was gone. You know, there might be people a lot like this Syrophoenician woman worshiping with us today. I don't know the hearts of everyone here. But I'm pretty sure there's people here with some great underlying faith. Faith in Jesus. A belief that he can do what he's promised. They're convinced that the roof may fall in, though, because they're here. Can't believe that I, I'm in church and the roof didn't fall in. I've been told that since I've been here. I was out calling one day, and a man said, I can't come to that church. If I come to that church, the roof will fall in. It's a true story. He just lives right there. I didn't point to your house. It's like, on, on down, on down that way. So that, that way. He, he told me he can't come, the roof will fall in. They might be afraid that they'll be exposed to the virus because they're here. Nevertheless, they push past their fear and they've showed up. They may want to slip out during the last hymn to avoid mixing with churchy people because sometimes that's uncomfortable for not so churchy people. They may not know all the churchy jargon, but they want to experience the words and the works of Jesus. Don't ignore them. And if you're one of them, don't allow yourself to be ignored. Never give up. Jesus has opened the door of grace to everyone. Race, upbringing, past sins, current situations will not block the grace of God. Jesus is here with open arms today. And persistence pays off. Let's read on there in verse number 30. She went home and found her child lying in bed, and the demon gone. G-O-N-E, gone. Now how cool is that? This woman's persistence paid off. She never gave up. The woman continued to beg for Jesus' intervention. She persisted until she received the blessings that she sought. Friends, we too need to be persistent in prayer. In a sense, this woman represents the entire Gentile world, and that includes most of us here, if not all of us. Jesus had come to the Jews, but their leaders rejected him. The bread thrown away by the Jews would soon be at the disposal of the Gentiles. The bread of life that they rejected would become ours to partake of. We mustn't miss what's being illustrated here. If we don't receive the bread of life from the hands of Jesus, if we're not willing to accept it from him, then eventually... It's going to be taken away. Eventually, we're going to close our eyes for the last time, breathe our last breath, and there will be no more opportunity. We need to accept the bread that Jesus offers. Here's the thing. God will not force us to eat at his table. 
This Gentile's woman's story gives us a great example of how we need to approach God, though. We must refuse to get discouraged. When our prayers are not immediately answered, we've got to keep on asking and asking and asking. Have you ever just exhausted everything you've got and you're completely worn out and you just fall on your knees and you say, God, I've had all I can take? You ever been there? That's where this woman was. God, I've had all I can take. I need your help. I need you to see me through. We must lay our case boldly before God. I did that last week. It was my third week working on a well pump. I put in the first one, hooked it all up, started it up, and it shot water out the side. I took it back, and they gave me a second one. I took it in, hooked it up, started it up. Whenever I did, it sorted directly out. Called the company. They said, take it back. It's got an internal sort. And then... I went and got a third one. I took it and I put it in. And after I got it inside of there, I went to prime it, and they had failed to introduce a priming hole to the pump. There was no place to put water in when they they manufactured it. So I took that one back, and I got a fourth pump. And I brought it back, and I put it in. And it started, and it ran, and I thought, praise God. And then about 20 minutes later, it lost its prime. And it was just like, God, I've had all I can take. My literal words, God, I've had all I can take. I can't take anymore. So I left, and I talked to the well man, and I said, this is what I've done. And he said, I know what your problem is. He said, you've installed the foot valve. He called it something else. He said, you installed it at an angle. That'll never work. It has to be straight up and down. So I went back, and I installed the foot valve straight up and down. And I didn't have time to test it, so I drove home and it said all week, after I got it primed, just let it sit all week. I went back this week and it started. It's like God heard my prayer, but not until I was at my wit's end. Until I'd done everything I could do. I tried everything I could try. It was just that point where you fall on your knees and say, God, I've had all I can take. We all get there sometimes. God, I've had all I can take. We've got to go before God boldly and just tell him what we are. He knows it anyway. This woman was passionate about her request. Her daughter was hurting. She was perfectly willing to boldly plead her case. Not every fervent prayer will be answered exactly as we ask. But God honors fervor. He honors prayer. This little girl, her mom was not half-hearted at all. When she stood before Jesus, it's like, come on, Jesus. Even the puppies get the crumbs. I mean, she, she got what he was saying, but she laid it right on Jesus even the prophet, just give me some crumbs, Jesus. I just need some crumbs. She was not lukewarm. And it's a good thing. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16 makes it clear that claiming to trust God while having a lukewarm faith makes God sick to his stomach. This woman was not lukewarm. She was on fire for Jesus. She believed he could do what he promised. She believed that her little girl would be healed, and when she got home, she was. Let's read on there, Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. Geographically speaking, this is just plain stupid. I know Jesus was doing it, and I don't understand why. It doesn't tell us why. We're not told why he went through Sidon. He's up here Tyre, over to Sidon. But way over here is where the Decapolis is. He went completely out of his way in order to get over there. Never tells us why he did that, just that he did that. He went through Sidon, made his way over to the Decapolis. Now, I'm sure Jesus had his reasons, but Mark doesn't record them. Ultimately, though, Jesus is headed back to a place where he was kicked out just a short time before. You remember the story. He cast a legion of demons out of a man, and in so doing, a local farmer lost 2,000 pigs. The demons entered those pigs, and they went nuts. They ran off a cliff and plunged to a watery death in the Sea of Galilee. The now freed man wanted to follow Jesus, wanted to get on the boat and go with him, but Jesus told him to go home and tell his story. He told his story, and people listened. This area is now wide open to Jesus. The population of the region is primarily Gentile. This is made clear by the fact that there's 2,000 hog farmers. Anybody know why? Why do I think 2,000 hogs on a farm makes it primarily Gentile? Because Jews won't have anything to do with pigs. They won't have anything to do with pigs. I found that out. I had a knee surgery, and we went to a 
a Colts football game in Indianapolis. And afterwards, my knee was hurting like crazy. We walked two or three blocks to this, I don't know, some kind of a Jewish joint. And I sat down at the table, it was hurting really bad. And my wife said, what do you want? I said, I'd like a ham sandwich with uh, Swiss cheese. <laughs> she went up to order it. She went up to order a ham sandwich with Swiss cheese. And, and they said, I'm sorry, man, we don't serve that here. <laughs> True story. That's why I think it was a largely Gentile area. Pigs are not a Jewish thing. But there are some Jews living in the territory of, of the Decapolis, the Jews that were living there resented the presence of the Gentiles. The Romans had moved in and they tried to change everything in order to kick out all memory of the Jews, but they were there to stay. The Greeks inundated the area with their culture. Here's the thing. Jesus had just helped a Gentile woman. Remember? That we just talked about? He told her he needed to meet the needs of the Jews first, and yet he's headed back to a heavily Gentile area. We don't want to miss this. This is an often overlooked reality. Jesus was pushing the Jewish envelope. He was cracking the door open so that the Gentiles could see what's inside. He was making it clear that the Gentiles were worthy of receiving his words and his works. Let's read on there to find out what happens next in Mark 7, 32 to 35. There's some people brought to him a man who was deaf, could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hands on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into his ears, and he spit, and he touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh said to him, Epita, which means be open. At this, the man's ears were open, and his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak. We're told very little about this man or his friends. Mark had clearly labeled the Syrophoenician woman as a Gentile. Remember, just we talked about it today. He made it clear she's a Gentile, but he chose not to label this man. I think there's a good chance that that's because this was a Jewish man coming to Jesus in the Gentile land. It would probably be good to note that there's no mention of faith on the part of the friends, no mention of faith on the part of the deaf man. Mark makes it clear that the deaf man has a speech impediment. It seems like Jesus wanted a bit of privacy as he dealt with this man's issues, so he took him over to a private spot. And then Jesus does some really weird stuff. Sticks his finger into the guy's ear. And then he spits on the guy's tongue. That just sounds gross. I'm told that those were customary healing procedures back then. I don't know, it sounds gross to me, but wow. Jesus healed the Syrophoenician woman's daughter without going anywhere near. Remember? Didn't get any place near. You have to wonder why there's so much touching and spitting in the case of this man. You just have to wonder why all that's going on. And Jesus still wasn't done. He looked up to heaven and said, Ephata, which means in English, be opened. Be opened. And immediately the man's tongue was set free. The idea in the text is that his tongue was in bondage. It's almost like his tongue, you know, everywhere tongue tied, Got that piece under this. It's almost like he was tongue-tied and Jesus set his tongue free. Once the man is healed, Jesus asks him to do something that is counterintuitive. Counterintuitive is something he wouldn't have wanted to have done at all. Mark chapter 7, verses 36 to 37. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He's done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Does anyone else... See just a little bit of irony in this. Anyone else see it? I mean, this man has been tongue-tied, unable to speak, and now he can talk. But Jesus tells him, don't speak. I made it so you can, but don't do it. Don't talk. Don't tell anyone. Now, this is huge for this man. He can hear. He can talk. I'm guessing every bone in his body wanted to climb to the top of the mountain and scream, I am healed. Now, that's got to stink. You want to cry and heal, and Jesus says, shh. We've got to remember, Jesus' works are a sidebar that gives credence to his words. It's the words of Jesus that he's come to proclaim. Jesus didn't want his ability to share his words to be pushed out by people's desire to experience his works. It didn't seem to matter what Jesus said about keeping this thing on the down low, though. There was no way this was going to be kept a secret. It'd be just like something around here today. It happens. Before you can get home, neighbor's 20 miles away, already heard about it. It's just the way the world works. 
The more Jesus said, don't tell, the latter they proclaimed his works. They were astounded by what Jesus had done. They said, Jesus has done everything really, really well. He makes the deaf hear. He makes the mute speak. The Jews, in what Jesus was doing, saw the fulfillment of the words of Isaiah that they had been studying since childhood. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Isaiah was predicting the coming of the Messiah. The fact that the crowds quoted this passage lets us know that they were beginning. They were beginning to make the connection between Jesus and the coming Messiah. This stuff wasn't normal. This stuff wasn't trickery. They knew this man. They knew Jesus had actually healed him. They were familiar with his infirmities. Jesus was the real deal, and there was no denying it. Just like someone who's hungry and who's found food wants to help other hungry people find food, these folks wanted to tell their friends and neighbors about Jesus so they too could be healed. If we care about our friends and our neighbors, we'll want to tell them about Jesus too. For those of us who have grown up in the church, we may be tempted to feel that we're the special ones with a place at the table. We've been going to worship since we were knee-high to a duck. But the bottom line is this. In the end, we all come as beggars to the table of God. Give me some crumbs, Jesus. Forgive me my sins, Jesus. Make me your child, God. It's but by the grace of God that we are fed. It's but by the grace of God that we are forgiven. It's but by the grace of God that we have hope. We must never forget that God's table is huge. There's room for Jews and Greeks alike. There's room for lifelong believers and sinners who've only recently accepted God's gift of grace. We've got nothing to boast about when we come before Jesus. We're all sinners saved by God's amazing grace. For those who've not accepted the wonderful grace of Jesus, there's a seat at the table for you. God will give you his name and give you so much more than crumbs. The marvelous grace of Jesus is more than enough. He's prepared an abundant life-giving feast for all who will come. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, he will raise us up to sit at his table for all eternity. You can count on it because he lives. We too can live if we come to him in obedient faith. If you're outside of Jesus, now's the time to come as we sing together, because he lives. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.